Well, this morning we have the privilege of celebrating the Lord's Supper together. And the Lord's Supper, at least in my experience at OBC, has always been, by nature, I think, a very special experience for us. Today has even more significance because of the fact that it is Palm Sunday. It's a day to celebrate Jesus as the Messiah, just as the people of Jerusalem did when Jesus entered the city for the final time before his crucifixion and ultimate resurrection, which, of course, we're going to celebrate together next Easter uh, Sunday morning, this coming Sunday. And so separately, the Lord's Supper is special. Palm Sunday is special. But by combining them today in preparation for Easter, I think we have a truly unique opportunity to see a very significant contrast between the two parts of Jesus' character that we've probably never really recognized. Now, you've already heard the scripture describing Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem by the Nichols family, who read to us from Mark chapter 11. But let me take just a moment and try to explain some of the significance of what was actually taking place there. In verse 2, as Jesus and the disciples were about to enter Jerusalem, just ahead of the celebration of Passover, Jesus gives two of his disciples this very strange errand to run. Did you pick up on what he asked them to do? He tells them to go into town and find a colt which has never been ridden, tied up, and waiting for them. Then when they find this colt, just as Jesus described that it would be, he rides that colt into Jerusalem. Now, at first glance, there may not seem to be a lot of significance in this. In fact, if you know that the colt was really a donkey... You could almost view this as a kind of humiliating experience, couldn't you? I mean, who, who rides a donkey? Surely that implies you're either poor or out of options or both, right? But in reality, the donkey had a very specific significance. Old Testament prophecy said that the Messiah would show up like this. This is Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey, which is exactly how Jesus would now enter the city of Jerusalem. Not only that, but it was the foal of a donkey no one had ever ridden. So what, you say? I mean, is that some kind of a big deal? Well, it just so happens that in the ancient Middle East, During this time in history, guess how kings traveled around within their cities? On donkeys, no one had ever ridden except for the king. How about that? So what does all of this mean? It means that when Jesus entered Jerusalem that day, he was making it perfectly clear just exactly who and what he was. A conquering king. Do you see it? But did the people get it? Did the people of Jerusalem really get it? Did they really understand what they were seeing and what was being played out before them? Let me read to you from Psalm 118, another prophecy describing the coming of the Messiah. It says this, Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done this very day, so let us rejoice today and be glad. Here it is, Lord, save us, which is also known as Hosanna. Lord, grant us success. Listen, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us with bows in hand. 
Join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. You have to admit, that is a pretty awesome verse, is it not? Now listen to the description from Mark 11 of what the people did, again, as Jesus entered the city. And many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread palm branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, Lord, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Do you understand who Jesus was claiming to be? Let me ask you a question. Do you think they shouted those famous phrases to every person who rode through the gates of Jerusalem? Absolutely not. There is no question. There is no doubt. They understood perfectly who Jesus was claiming to be. And they, as the people, were confirming that claim with their praise. Now, we move forward four days to the night Jesus is arrested. And for us as a church, we now, in this moment, we put the celebration of Palm Sunday behind us. Do you understand? We have celebrated this morning. We have seen the kids sing. We have talked about Hosanna, Lord save us. But now, we put that behind us. And now we begin over these next few days before Easter to look towards the cross. Jesus and the disciples have gathered to eat the traditional Passover meal together. The same meal that will become the model for the Lord's Supper that we're going to observe together this morning. Keep in mind that the disciples are still thinking of Jesus as a conquering king, which is completely understandable, but it's also why they must have been completely shocked and confused by what Jesus does when the meal is completed. Listen to this. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. There's the shift. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress. The devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. And so he got up from the meal, he took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist like a servant. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize what I am now, what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter. You will never wash my feet. You got to love Peter. Amen? I mean, here's the deal. In about six seconds, Jesus is going to wash Peter's feet. And Peter is saying, you will never. You know anybody who uses language like that all the time? It's always this way. It's never like that. Peter says, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. He's all in, this Peter, okay? Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need to only wash their feet. Your whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. Verse 12. When he had finished washing each of their feet, he put on his outer clothing and returned to his place at the table. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. 
Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Now, you have to admit, the contrast is pretty obvious, is it not? One day we see a conquering king. Four days later, we see a humble servant washing his followers' feet and presenting them with an almost uncomfortable picture of humility. OBC, this is our Messiah. These are the two sides of the Savior that we worship today. He is both king and a servant. He is worthy to be praised and he loves us enough to humble himself and serve us. And so, as we observe the Lord's Supper this morning, I want you to keep those two characteristics in your heart and mind. I want you to think about a servant and a king. Now, the Bible says it's important that before we take Lord's Supper, we stop and spend some time reflecting on the significance of the sacrifice and the condition of our heart. We want to be as right with God as we can possibly be. I'm going to remind you that only Christians, those who have placed their faith in Jesus as their Savior, are to take the Lord's Supper. So if you haven't done that, you shouldn't participate in this this morning. However, if this is something you've been thinking about, something you've been considering, something that you think you may be ready to do, let me encourage you that you are only one prayer away from the most important decision you could ever make in your entire life. And I'm telling you, even at OBC, you would absolutely not be the first person to make that decision to become a Christian as a result of the Lord's Supper. We have seen that happen before. So whether you're a Christian who needs to spend some time getting your heart right with God right now, or whether you're considering a commitment to Christ for the first time in your life, we need to take some time right now to stop and to seek God. As our praise team comes, I want to ask you as Christians to use this time to confess your sin and ask your Heavenly Father to cleanse your heart. Please, please do not just, just motor through this time. This is an important time. If you're not a Christian, right now is an opportunity for you to make that life-changing decision. And, and I'm going to be here at the front. Our executive pastor, Paul, our youth pastor, Marwin, we're going to be standing here at the front. And if you're not a Christian... I would encourage you to come forward during this time and let us pray with you. Let us visit with you for a moment about what this decision means and how you can do this. So as we bow our heads right now, let me go ahead and ask you to do that. Let's come humbly before our God. Heavenly Father, there are just two kinds of people here this morning. Those who know you and those who don't yet know you. But God, our prayer is that for those of us who know you, that we would grow even closer to you today. And our prayer is that for those who don't yet know you, that they might come to know you today by placing their trust and their faith in you, in Jesus as Savior, God. I pray that you will go to work in each of our hearts right now, no matter who we are or where we've been, what our experience with you is. Father, I pray that you will speak to our hearts. We ask as a people for cleansing. We repent of our sin, God. Help us to be right before you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.